Our second scripture reading comes from Luke 21, and I'll be reading chapter, or verses 5 through 6 and 20 through 28. Some people were talking about the temple, how it was decorated with beautiful stones and ornaments dedicated to God. Jesus said, as for the things you are admiring, the time is coming when not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you will know that its destruction is close at hand. At that time, those in Judea must flee to the mountains, those in the city must escape, and those in the countryside must not enter the city. These are the days of punishment when everything written will find its fulfillment. How terrible it will be at that time for women who are pregnant or for women who are nursing their children. There will be great agony on the earth and angry judgment on the people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken away as captives among nations. Jerusalem will be plundered by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are concluded. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and the stars. On the earth there will be dismay among the nations in their confusion over the roaring of the sea and surging waves. The planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken, causing people to faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. Then they will see the human one coming on a cloud with power and great splendor. Now when these things begin to happen, Stand up straight and raise your heads because your redemption is near. Stand up straight, raise your heads for your redemption is near. Every new season where we remember Christ's coming thousands of years ago, we also anticipate Christ's coming in the future when that prayer we pray every Sunday will become complete, that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know just from listening to our joys and concerns all the places where God's will is being done right now here on earth as it is in heaven. And we also very much know the places where God's will is not being done here on earth as it is in heaven. And so this waiting season is a waiting season for us to figure out how to live that future reality that we pray for as if it were already the present. We know that we're waiting for the fullness of God's hope, peace, joy, and love. But there's also a way that we, come next week, like John the Baptist, can prepare the way so that that hope, peace, joy, and love might be felt just a little bit more by a few more people because of the way that we live. It's a long story. It's a long journey. It's a lot of work. Part of what we've been doing this whole fall is looking at the story of David from shepherd to king. And Bill was talking last week about how important it is to know where we've come from, right? And figuring out our next faithful step moving forward. And so part of this, when we wait for the Messiah, who is of the lineage of David, when we wait for the stump of Jesse for a shoot to spring forth, what are we saying with that? What are we waiting for? What are we hoping for? And so I want to go on a history journey with you today and looking at the world that Jesus was born into because there's a hot minute and a half that's happened between King David's death and Jesus being born, right? And as we go through this, you're going to look at just cycle after cycle of life coming again. And I know that that experience and that feeling is unfortunately not a stranger to us 2,000 years later. So how is God at work in time after time again of things not working out, of God's will not being done on earth as it is in heaven? And once we get into the rhythm of this, that text that we just read, that Rob just read for us, that feels so dramatic and so tense and so distant, I think it's going to feel a little closer. And the reason that it is a part of scripture and the reason that people in every age and the crises of every age have wanted that Messiah and that Savior, have yearned for that 
moment where all will be made right and feeling that they are in the end times, that there is no way forward. Whether that is personal crises or social crises, we serve a God who makes the impossible possible, who makes a way when we only see endings and wilderness. And so let's sink ourselves in to how that happened. Now, this is going to be interactive, so get ready to wake up and move a little bit and work with me here, all right? So we're in the book of First Kings, and in the opening of Second Kings, King David dies, right? This is the king who united the 12 tribes of Israel, built the city of Jerusalem, brought the Ark of the Covenant back, and who is the next king after that? Solomon. All right. And what was Solomon known for? Wisdom and temple. All right. Building the temple. All right. That's going to be really important because you saw the image, right, of Jesus predicting the temple being torn down. That's going to happen a couple times. All right. So the temple's built. Solomon dies. What happens? Pause, Barry. Don't give him the answer. Okay. What happens to the kingdom? Think of all the rebellions that David had to put out coming back. Were the tribes getting along together very well? So what happens? Rob, there we go. You had it. Yep. All right. So the kingdom splits, right? So the northern are the ten tribes, and the capital is Samaria. Is this beginning now to make sense of why all of this is important, right? There's some certain th stories about Samaria that we're going to hear as we go through Jesus' life. And then the two southern tribes are called Judah, with the capital being Jerusalem, the city that David built. So when Rob reads his passage from Jeremiah today, it only referenced Judah and Jerusalem because, very next slide, Israel fell to the Assyrians in 721 BCE. So I'm giving you the scripture reference of all this, it, where this is. These are the last 10, the lost 10 tribes because the way that military conquest happened at the time, you conquered a people, you need them to not be all together in the same place to foment a rebellion. So you drag them to other parts of your kingdom to exile them, and then you bring other people from other parts of the kingdom there. And so you keep everything um, in the power structure that you want it to be in. But this meant that there was a lot of intermarriage and a lot of change. And so if you're in Judah and Jerusalem trying to keep your Abrahamic ancestry aligned and hold to that faith, um, you're going to say to your cousins, unfortunately, and uh, this is not what we should do. This is what happened um, in Israel, that they are lost, that they are no longer a part of the Abrahamic line because, they're, because of all the intermarriage um, and the exile and the deportations and the resettlement that happened. So they are the lost tribes. They are no longer a part of Israel. Now, if you're in northern Israel, how does that settle with you? Yeah, Kelsey's shaking her head like, mm-mm. Exactly. So now we're to feel, right, some of the tension between the Samaritans and the Jews that we feel, right, in our Gospels? Yeah, it started all the way back here. Okay, Judah lasts a little bit longer, but it also falls to Babylon in 586 BCE, and then there's again another exile and diaspora, because again, this is how you manage. Um, these are really tragic things. Read Second Kings chapter 25 and, and see what they did to the king and the sons uh, and how they set their power in place. These, these are memories that are not forgotten. And I share this with you because for as we come to the New Testament to gospel preaching to Jesus' words, the two biggest memories of the Jewish people are going to be this Babylonian exile and then what happens afterwards. And so this is going to be everyone's subcontext. Also, incidentally for us, there's a reason that when we have communion like last Sunday, we have the bread that is broken for us that is then made whole for all of the times that we are damaged and broken by life, and then Jesus' promise of healing. But then we also have the cup, 
right? This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. For when we're the ones who do the sinning and the harming. And the two biggest points of, of theology and of experience in the life of faith of the Israelites are the exodus, when they are the ones who are healed and saved from doing the harm, and now the Babylonian exile, when they are the ones who have done the harm and the brokenness that ensues from there. We read from Jeremiah later on, go back to Jeremiah chapter 7 and 8, for his speech at the temple and calling account for the harm that was being done. It's intense. Okay, now we have... After Babylon comes the Persians and Cyrus the Great. This is the only other time where the title Messiah is used in scripture. And it is used for someone who is not an Israelite, who is not Jewish. It is used for someone outside of this ethnic and religious group. But because of what Cyrus did as a Persian, he was named Messiah. And so for us, as we look to what it means to be of the lineage of David, for that skirmish between the northern and the southern tribes of what it means to be of the lineage of David and of Abraham's descendants, this in scripture offers another way to think about this and look about it. So the Persian Empire comes and Cyrus lets the Jews return to Jerusalem. And so this is a huge piece of exile ending, and they get to go home, and they get to what to that temple? Rebuild it. This is a really big deal. So go to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah for this. This is a huge coming together. Of course, a lot of conflict, because as anyone who's been in a study abroad or time away knows, life keeps going on even though you're not there, and there's a lot of work to bring it all back together again when you are back. But it was a period of, of some independence and some beautiful reform. And then... Alexander the Great comes along, and the Persian Empire is no more, and the Greek Empire is established. So we're starting to feel, right, like we have the Assyrians, we have the Babylonians, we have the Persians, we have the Greeks, and then we're going to have the Romans. And there's always something. You all, life is hard. It's not about just, okay, we got to make it through this storm, and then everything's going to be okay again. Life is chaotic, and finding a way to live in the midst of that and to find faith through that in spite of that is critical, not just for survival, but for thriving. And this is a period of the great persecution. Once Alexander the Great dies and does not name an heir, there's a whole big period there. We get Antiochus IV. Um, it's horrible. And you'll have to go to Daniel chapter 7. Um, if you think the imagery from today's scripture was intense, that is apocalyptic end time scripture because the level of intensity was so much and so hard. You have to have the strongest imagery possible to pull you through that to find hope in the midst of that level of hopelessness. This is also... The time of first and second Maccabees, because under Antiochus IV, we have the Maccabean Revolt. Who knows what the Maccabean Revolt led to? Corey? Hanukkah! And so we celebrate this Jewish revolt that did overthrow Antiochus IV for a while, right? And, and then celebrates the eight-day festival of the life because they reclaimed the temple that Antiochus had completely um, dismembered and and just not in stone on stone but the level we'll get to it was bad we're just going to leave it there because time's running out <laughs> it was bad um, and so the Maccabeans come back there's an eternal flame to be kept lit and they only had oil for one day but it takes seven days to make the oil and so we celebrate Hanukkah the miracle of the oil lasting the entire time that it took the people to make the new oil to reclaim the temple and so this is a period that lasts for about a century of some independence um, for, for the Jewish community and nation. But unfortunately, as humanity goes, infighting started to come between the rulers, and they actually brought in a Roman officer to arbitrate the disagreement. 
So he basically handed everything over, and Pompey takes Jerusalem because, God bless humanity, we can't get anything right, and we can't get out of our own way. And so that happens, and Roman occupation comes, and now we have the world that we're more familiar with that Jesus is born into. We all, as humanity, react to power and occupation and crisis differently. And it comes from where we're set up in life and where we're not in terms of class and wealth. It comes from what we value personally. It comes from the power we have and what we can affect. And it comes from our personality and how we're wired and the experiences of life that shape us. And that is no different for this community living under occupation that Jesus is born into. It is not a monolithic community by any way, shape, or form. In fact, Flavius Josephus, um, did I get his name right, Barry, um, is a Jewish historian in the first century BCE who describes this time period as Jewish sectarianism, um, in that there were four groups. So we have the Sadducees, And they were tied to the temple. They are your most elite and wealthiest upper class who collaborate with the Roman officers in terms of power and holding that. So when the temple is destroyed in 70 um, CE, we don't hear about them anymore because they were so tied to the temple, um, their time and power completely dissipates. And then the Pharisees, okay, we know them, we've got them, right? Um, so they are also a part of the wealthy class and the way that they find a way to hold their identity in the midst of Roman occupation is to stick with purity laws, to follow to the letter to the law, right? Not just the purity laws, but those that were reserved for priests only. So they bring it all in. But in order to be able to follow that, you have to have enough wealth to be able to choose professions that enable you to keep those purity laws and those rituals. And so there is a level of privilege and wealth within this community as well. But here's what I want us to know. We disparage the Pharisees a lot because of how they came into conflict with Jesus. But what I want us to build is empathy of how hard they were trying to preserve the Jewish faith and nation and identity in a way that they could under a very impossible situation of Roman occupation. As did the Essenes, who had enough privilege and wealth to leave completely. We don't hear about them in the Gospels at all because they withdrew from society. Who knows, remembers about the Qumran community, right? And finding the Dead Sea Scrolls there. That was a community of Essenes who chose to withdraw completely, right? These are all ways that we deal with conflict that come up. We withdraw completely. We find a way to carve out a niche. We collaborate with the power. And then the fourth philosophy that later in the after Jesus passed um, formed into the zealots and led the rebellion that then the Romans quashed and destroyed the temple in 70 CE. So we go into the politics of it all like the Maccabeans did and try to find a way forward. Life is messy. We all try to find what the next faithful step is because we all care about who we are, whose we are, and protecting what we have built in terms of a legacy for the next generation. But what we choose or how we choose to do that will always be different and will almost always be in conflict because there are so many different ways. So as we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, so we pray for that space here. And here's the beautiful thing about God. God makes a way where we don't even see a way. So here are the groups, the players, right? Except we haven't even mentioned the Samaritan Jews, and we haven't even mentioned the numerical majority of the Jews living at that time that the Pharisees called people of the land, Anawim. That's Mary, that's Joseph, that's Elizabeth, that's the shepherds. The people and the places we don't even expect to have our next faithful step or where God shows up and brings us hope. 
So my prayer for us is one, to have empathy with everyone doing their best, trying to find the next faithful step. And two, to always be ready for God to surprise us and to be the people that can embrace that truth, even though we have no idea if anything good can come out of Bethlehem and Nazareth. But to find that and to take that hope, to root ourselves in that peace and that love and that joy, and to make this future reality we pray for a present reality. There are lots of different ways to do this, and I am taking the lesson from John the Baptist that we will look at next week for how we do that in our commitment coming forward. There are all kinds of different ways, so withdraw in prayer as the Essenes did, advocate for social change, maybe not in the way the Zealots did, but we can find ways to do that peacefully. Invite neighbors to worship as the Pharisees did, and, and owning those rituals, give generously. Make a way for the future to be the present. Let us stand and join and sing in body or in spirit.